Good afternoon, everyone, and greetings to our brethren around the world. Welcome to all our guests. As you heard the announcements, you are invited to join us for fellowship and for a covered dish meal after services and a Bible study to follow after that. Two days ago in London, England, terrorist bomb explosions killed more than 50 individuals and injured more than 700. Government officials increased security alerts in many different cities, and here in the United States, of course, the terror alert was raised up even higher for transportation systems. Millions of Britons and others around the world would not only condemn the brutal attacks, but they were shaken by these events. Mr. Meredith uh, responded quickly by writing a po and posting a commentary on our website. He wrote, quoting the online uh, WSJ, quote, a visibly shaken, a visibly shaken British Prime Minister Tony Blair hosting the group of eight leaders in Scotland declared London had suffered a series of terrorist attacks clearly timed to coincide with the summit and called it barbaric. As we all know, the toll of dead and injured is likely to rise. This is, this is indeed a horrible tragedy. All of us should pray for the victims and their families. So I hope we've been doing that. Mr. Meredith continues, but it will do only a limited amount of good to sorrow over what has already happened, for this is only the beginning of the series of terrorist attacks, as Prime Minister Blair of Britain called them, which are predicted by the Creator to continue. And these attacks are destined to affect primarily the Americans, the British, and the other, other British-descended peoples of the world. Mr. Meredith asked why, and he goes on to explain why. In an article coming up in the September-October Tomorrow's World magazine, Mr. Meredith has written an article entitled, Face Reality. And we, brethren, in this dangerous time, must face reality. Mr. Pardian wrote, as we heard in the announcements in the World Update, World Ahead Update, quote, We in God's church are deeply grieved by these terrorist attacks, but we are not surprised because we know that prophecy marches on. I was watching television news, and uh, Senator Joe Biden commented on the terrorist threats and possibilities here in the United States regarding the, our transportation system. And he said the potential, quote, the potential for carnage is overwhelming, is what the senator said concerning the threats here in the United States. We know that last year, March 11, 2004, commuter trains traveling in Madrid were bombed by terrorists. Then about 200 were killed and 1,500 were injured. So some of us need to be shaken about the realities of today's dangerous world, but the Bible also tells us not to be shaken regarding spiritual misinformation. Let's turn to 2 Thessalonians, the second chapter, 2 Thessalonians 2. Now, most of us have been grounded in the truth, but yet God still allows these tragedies, these events, these tribulations to test us. Are we going to remain faithful and stable and not be turned aside and shaken, that is, to the extent that we fall away? 2 Thessalonians, the second chapter, verse 1. The Apostle Paul writes, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or, or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Sometimes it's a personal tragedy. Sometimes it's a tragedy or some traumatic event in the world that sometimes shaken, shakes us and perhaps moves us off our solid spiritual foundation. So God is going to allow our faith to be tested. And if he's going to allow our faith to be tested, then we need to be established on a solid foundation upon which our faith can grow. Several weeks ago, we discussed seven fundamentals of true Christianity. Today, I would like to continue that discussion 
with more fundamentals of Christianity and discuss also our responsibility to grow spiritually, to develop spiritually, and to go on to perfection. Let's turn to Hebrews, the sixth chapter, for by way of review. I challenge you that time to uh, turn to the basic scripture that gives us fundamental doctrines of the church. These are the fundamental doctrines God gives us in Hebrews, the sixth chapter. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection. And then he lists the six basic doctrines. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of the resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permit. Now what does he mean that this we will do if God permit? Let's go back to the first sentence. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection. So that's the title of the sermon, Going On to Perfection. Actually, the sermon is part two of the fundamentals of Christianity. Other versions say, let us go on to maturity. There are several words in both the Old Testament and New Testament that are translated uh, perfect or perfection. In the Old Testament, it's shalem and tamim. In the New Testament, teleos and teleotes. There are several others as well. The International Standard Bible Encyclopedia says this about the word perfect in the Old Testament. Perfect in the Old Testament is a translation of shalem, meaning finished, whole, complete. It's used except uh, used of persons. For example, a perfect heart that is holy or completely devoted to Yahweh, 1 Kings 8.61 for example. So God says he has a perfect heart. In other words, it's wholehearted. It's completely dedicated toward God. It's used to, uh, for persons except Deuteronomy 25.15 where perfect is used for perfect weights. In other words, God wants us to be accurate in our business. He wants us to be honest and he wants us to have accurate or perfect weights. That's Deuteronomy 25 verse 15. Tamim, that, that's the description of shalem. Tamim is translated complete, perfect, sound or unblemished, and is also used of persons and of God, his way and his law. Noah was a just man and perfect, uh, given as an example here. As for God, his way is perfect. Let's turn to that, to uh, Psalm 18 and verse 30. Psalm 18 and verse 30. Because if we are going on to perfection, then we need the guidelines for that completeness, for that maturity, for that perfection. Psalm 18 and verse 30. And this is the word tamim in Hebrew. Psalm 18 and verse 30, where David writes, As for God, his way is perfect. Now you find this expression Several times in the Bible, this is just one reference that says that God's way is perfect. The word of the eternal is tried. He is a buckler to all those that trust in him. And then uh, 1917, that is Psalm 197, excuse me, Psalm 197. The law of the eternal is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the eternal is sure, making wise the simple. So the Hebrew word there is Tamim. Now, the International Bible Encyclopedia in the New Testament states the following. In the New Testament, perfect is usually the translation of teleos, primarily having reached the end, term, limit, hence complete, full, or perfect. Matthew 5, 48, you therefore be, shall be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Or Matthew 19, 21, he told the rich man, if you would be perfect, go and sell what you have. You remember that one. And then Ephesians 4, verse 13, till we all come unto a perfect man, or the revised version has full grown. The other Greek word is uh, teleu, to, to perfect or to end or to complete. Luke 13, 32. The third day I am perfected, or 
I end my course. So there are these words that tell us we need to be complete, we need to be mature, we need to be per- perfect. But what is perfection and what is our goal? We, know all, we all know what our goal is, and that's the kingdom of God and God's righteousness. That's Matthew 6, verse 33. But to be in the kingdom of God, we must grow in spiritual character. We need to become like Christ. How do we do that? There are many hundreds of scriptures that would give us principles, but let's turn to Romans, the 12th chapter. Romans, the 12th chapter, in verse 1, an exhortation by the Apostle Paul. Romans 12 and verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now, sometimes I hesitate to do a project or help someone, and I realize, whoop, I better think about laying down my life for my brothers. It says in John 15, 13, greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends, and that we are to be living sacrifices. So we all have our special interests, our personal projects and desires, And yet sometimes we have to sacrifice those to help others who are in need. So he says that we are to be a living sacrifice. Verse 2, And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. And we certainly need to keep our minds alert and renewed. I remember, as I've told you before in my sermon notes, I will sometimes put QQ, meaning quotable quote. I remember one time back in uh, Big Sandy at Ambassador College, our campus newspaper, the portfolio, printed a list of quotable quotes. Mr. Meredith had visited the campus, and one of those quotes was, which I still remember to this day, probably back in the 60s or early 70s, saturate your mind with the word of God. So that's a quotable quote that uh, is a part of my memory. And it's certainly a part of helping to renew our minds. We renew our minds by putting into our minds God's word and the way he thinks, that you may prove, continuing in verse 2, Romans 12, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So God has a perfect will, and we need to test it, accept it, embrace it, and practice it. Romans 8 and verse 29. We are in the transformation period. We are being transformed. We are being renewed, and that should be a daily renewal. Romans 8, verse 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed. Now, what did God purpose in us? He wants us to be changed. When we look around the world and we see terrorists, we see hideous, selfish, pervert perversion going on in many nations around the world and horrible things taking place. He wants us to be conformed to the character, the image, the nature of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. So God wants us to think like he thinks. We are to practice the fundamentals of Christianity. Mr. Meredith has emphasized that we need to reflect Jesus Christ. That means... We need to bear the fruits of the Holy Spirit. We need to have radiate Christ's nature of outgoing concern. Mr. Herbert Armstrong, in the book Mystery of the Ages, page 135, discusses character. We all know what God is doing with our co- with our co- with our cooperation that He's creating in each every in each and every one of us, if we want Him to his perfect righteous character, to be transformed to the image of Christ. Mr. Armstrong wrote on page 135 of Mystery of the Ages in the section, The Mystery of Man, quote, What then is man? He is a living being made from the dust of the ground. He is clay, and God is the master potter, molding, shaping, forming our character, if we respond when he calls and draws us to him with our willingness He is infusing into us his very own spiritual, holy, righteous, and perfect character. 
Now, you heard the expression so many times, well, nobody's perfect, and sometimes we just use that as an excuse for our foibles and fallibilities. I remember a story Mr. Armstrong told one time when uh, he was having some work done on his home. I think it was North Hill Street, and whether it was a door opening, and the carpenter had misaligned the top of the door. And uh, Mr. Armstrong <laughs> told him, to, uh, you need to take that out and redo it. That's, that's, not, that's not level. And the carpenter complained. He said, Herbert Armstrong, you're a perfectionist. And Mr. Armstrong said, you bet I, well, he, I don't think he said, you, I bet, you bet I am. But he did say, that's right, I am a perfectionist. Now, some have taken that term perfectionist to the extreme when in applying it to legalism and to uh, non-spiritual approach to God's way. But God is perfectionist in terms of our growing in his perfect character. Mr. Armstrong continues. I'll repeat that sentence. With our willingness, he, God, is infusing into us his very own spiritual, holy, righteous, perfect character. Why is man? God created man on the earth to build in us what the sinning angels refused to let God build in them, his perfect character, end of quote. So how do we become like Christ? We become like Christ by practicing the fundamentals. I gave that uh, sermon a few weeks ago, and I gave you seven foundational doctrines. I won't repeat all of them, but I, by way of review, I will just list the seven foundational doctrines we d discussed fairly thoroughly at that time. By way of review, they were, number one, internalize the basic doctrines of Hebrews 6. I don't expect you to write these all down right now. You can uh, perhaps uh, take the tape out or uh, the CD and listen to it again. But number one was internalize the basic doctrines of Hebrews 6. We just read Hebrews 6. Keep the commandments of God. Jesus said, if you will enter into life, keep the commandments. Matthew 19, 17 was num number two. Keep the commandments of God. Number three, study and practice the Sermon on the Mount. Number four was to rejoice in the new covenant. Number five was to fulfill Christ's mission. In other words, as we've taught in the church all these years, that we are not after selfish salvation. Much of the world is practicing, even though they may not realize it, selfish salvation. They don't think in terms of fulfilling a mission that Christ has given us to go into all the world to preach the gospel as a witness to the world and to feed the flock and to give the Ezekiel warning. Number five was fulfill Christ's mission. Number six was to prove God's Sabbath. And I gave you very solid proof from uh, Hebrews, the uh, fourth chapter. It also showing you from the Anchor Bible Dictionary that the Greek word or the word uh, sabbatismos was used to mean a physical meeting and convocation on the seventh day. And we rest, as it says there in Hebrews, the fourth chapter, he that has entered into his rest has ceased from his own works as God did from his. And we go back to verse 4, I believe it is, it says God rested the seventh day from his work. So we rest the same way God does, God did, and we prove God's Sabbath. That's a fundamental of true Christianity. Number seven was to understand God's holy day, God's holy day plan of salvation. And that's unique to the, the church of God. The churches of this world do not understand God's plan of salvation. They, he doesn't have a plan. He, he sent his son, and you believe on his son, and that's it. That's all there is to salvation. No, that is not all there is to it. God has a seven-day holy day and a seven-festival plan of keeping the holy days and giving us understanding through those festivals. I'd like to take time now to consider five more fundamentals of true Christianity, which are the basis for our going on to perfection. And if we are to go on to perfection, 
we must practice these fundamentals. So this is number eight, actually, following on the first sermon and the fundamentals of Christianity. Number eight, you'll turn to Ephesians, the second chapter. Number eight is to build on the church's foundation. What is the foundation of the church? Ephesians, the second chapter. Let's turn to Ephesians 2 and start in verse 19. Ephesians 2, 19. Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built, you are built upon the foundation. What is that foundation? Of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. The prophets were what we call the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures. So the foundation is not just what some Protestants believe is the New Testament. Forget about the Old Testament. Forget about the Hebrew Scriptures. No, the foundation of God's true church includes the prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together grows unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom also you are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. So we are God's building, and we're built upon that foundation. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians, the third chapter. We're warned about how we build on that foundation. 1 Corinthians, the third chapter. Of course, he's warning those who are leaders that they need to be careful. He says in verse 6, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So neither he is he that plants anything, neither he that waters, but God that gives the increase. We're all, all a family, as Mr. Meredith emphasized in the sermon last Sabbath. We are a team. We're working together. Now he that plants and he that waters are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry. You are God's building. Or you are God's field, as it has in the New King James Version. Verse 10. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another builds thereon. But let every man take heed how he builds thereon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, you can read through the remaining part of the Scripture here because he warns us about how to build. If any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. He says in verse 16, Know you not that you are the temple of God. So God wants us to build on that foundation. And we grow as we serve, as we help, as we partake in God's work. But he warns us how we are to build on that foundation. There's much more we could say on that, but because of time I'll go on. So number eight is to build on the church's foundation. Number nine is to conform to Christ's character. I already read Romans 8 verse 29. But let's turn to Ephesians 2 and verse 8. Be conformed to Christ's character. How much of Christ's character is in you? And when people see you, do they see any of the characteristics of Christ? Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 10. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves... It is the gift of God. Now, the Protestants make the mistake here of saying that grace is the gift, but not faith. But both are the gift. Faith is a gift. And it is not our own faith that saves us. It is the faith of Christ, as we find in Galatians 2.20, Galatians 2.16. And uh, that is the faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We're not saved by works, but we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. So we are to be conformed to Christ's character. We are to produce fruit. We are to, again, be transformed into the very mind and nature of Christ, I won't turn there, but as it says in Psalm 51, verse 10, 
and I hope you pray this, I pray it from time to time, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. God is the great creator, and the masterpiece of his creation is sitting right here in this audience in our congregations around the world. The masterpiece of God's creation is the saints who go through trials and who suffer and by the end of their life are perfected through sufferings and tests. And they are totally dedicated and committed and yielded and have the mind and the nature of Christ. I mentioned this before, but I know that some of you have experienced the same thing. I visited uh, several people on their deathbed who were dying of cancer. And I saw in my conversation with those individuals spiritual character and nature that I had not yet attained. A level of maturity, a level of um, spiritual dynamism and character that is what we're all headed for. We all need to go on to that perfection. But we need to understand our part and, start and understand God's part in the process. But we need to want God to create in us his perfect character. Brethren, we need to pray that God, like David did, create in me a clean heart, O God. Create in me your nature. I need your mind. I need your nature, your very character. Christ is the vine and we are the branches and we bear fruit. God is the husbandman or the the gardener. And so he says that that we we glorify God through much fruit there in John 15. I believe it's around verse uh, 8. So number nine of fundamentals of Christianity is to conform to Christ's character. And it's a process. Number 10 would probably be rejected by some religious groups, and that is fear God. Ecclesiastes 12.13, remember that the great King Solomon experimented, as the book of Ecclesiastes describes, with all kinds of riches, with glory. He, he, uh, he built buildings, he had agricultural projects, he had uh, singers, and, of course, he had, uh, what was it, 700 wives and 500 concubines. There's the little, little child uh, misunderstood and said uh, 700 wives and 500 porcupines. But, uh, you know, Solomon made a big mistake. He let the distractions of this world, but he did teach us one solid truth. And that's at the end of all of the experimentation. He said, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. It's a striving after wind. And what's been done before is now being, what's being done now has been done before. It's nothing new under the sun in terms of man's nature and vanity. But he said in verse 13 of Ecclesiastes 12, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments For this is the whole duty of man in the King James, or this is the whole purpose of man. This is the whole man, to fear God and to keep his commandments. Let's turn back to Deuteronomy 10 and verse 12. Again, some say that fearing God is primitive, that you fear God, and then as you grow in uh, character, you no longer fear God, but you love God. Well, they are not mutually exclusive. They are both required, and they are both dy- uh, dynamics of our loving God. Deuteronomy ten twelve. And now, Israel, what does the eternal your God require of you? What does God require? But to fear the eternal your God. That means to reverence him. When we face reality, the greatest reality is the existence of God and who He is and what He's done. And when you ask God to help you to see the vastness of the universe and you begin to see, where are you in this universe? Who are you in the vastness of this universe? 
The earth is just like a little grain of sand. And that even perhaps is huge by comparison in this endless sea of galaxies. And if you looked at even the Milky Way galaxy, even in a, let's say, a map of it, and it's been mapped before, you couldn't find planet Earth. It's less than a little pinprick. And you are somewhere on that little grain of sand. And when you think of it that way, you are nothing. And I am nothing. But on the other hand, you are something. Because God called you and he called me to be something. To be his born again son in the kingdom. And he's giving us the responsibility of setting the example to the world of how true Christianity operates. Because we are the light of the world, we're to become the light of the world and the salt of the earth. We have several tapes in our library or sermon uh, tapes, The Blessings of a Godly Fear, number 54, A Godly Fear and Respect, that was by Mr. Carl McNair, uh, number 145, the Fear of God by Dr. Winnell, number 125. Of course, along with that comes the teachable attitude. When you fear God, you want to learn, Isaiah 66, 2. To this man will I look, to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit and trembles at my word, who understands what the real reality is. Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And so we need to internalize those words and make them a part of our thinking, a part of our very nature and the way we live. And so in Psalm 25, I'll just quote it, verses 4 and 5. It says, Teach me thy ways, O Lord. Show me thy paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. On you do I wait all the day. It's that teachable attitude. You want to learn. You want to change. You want to go on to perfection. Not perfection for your own vanity's sake, but perfection so that you can be like God is and have His nature, to have His mind. We have a sermon tape number 268 on a teachable attitude. So God gives us wonderful promises, and to have that fear of God as a fundamental of true Christianity is extremely important because it's one of the foundational elements of who you are, what you are, and what you believe. You, every one of us needs to prove that God does exist. We saw the telecast here just by Mr. O'Gwyn. And then we've had other telecasts along that same line. Actually, we have a CD uh, that was offered on the following telecast, Can You Prove God Exists, that uh, had an excellent uh, telecast audio by uh, Mr. Meredith, on uh, does God exist? And he gave five reasons why I believe God exists. Very inspiring. I'm, uh, how many of you ordered that CD from the telecast? Say, you didn't do that. I'm sorry. Oh, one of you did. Very good. See, you're missing out. You are missing out. You need to understand that what we offer on the telecast, if it isn't available, you need to uh, educate yourselves on what is available. Of course, if you've seen the telecast in the first place, uh, you would have heard it at least once. The fear of God is also the beginning of knowledge. You know that, Proverbs 1, verse 7. The fear of the eternal is the beginning of wisdom, Proverbs 9, verse 10. You know that also. So the foundation is to prove God exists and to prove that the Bible is his word because your very life depends on that. Your very decision-making process depends on whether you know that God exists and whether you know that the Bible is his instruction to you personally. That is an extremely important foundation. I was watching the Discovery Channel here some time ago and they were looking at... uh, Jericho, and of course they thought that uh, when the walls came tumbling down that that, was, that didn't really happen, although other archaeologists have dated um, the fall of Jericho or the Jericho ruins, which we visited on a couple of occasions, uh, back to the uh, 13th century because that's the wrong date because they say, well, the Exodus 
under Pharaoh Ramses took place in the 13th century. Therefore, what happened at Jericho was the, in the, uh, around the 1200s. Well, no, uh, other archaeologists have gotten it right uh, closer to the, um, the date of the Exodus, which we believe is around the 1440s uh, B.C., and Jericho had fallen. But anyway, the Discovery Channel commentator was saying, Jericho can still be read metaphorically. If we take the Bible literally, we miss the point. This expert missed the point because he did not believe that the Bible is God's word, that it can be demonstrated to be accurate historically as well as to be dynamic spiritually. So number 10 is to fear God. Number 11, and I just gave a sermon on this uh, some weeks ago, recapture true values. Jesus came, John 10.10, 10, that we might have life and that we might have it more abundantly. We know that Christianity is a way of life. It's a way of giving and of serving. Let's turn to Galatians 6.10 is just one of the elements of that way of life. Galatians 6. And verse 10, and it should be a part of our nature. The second great commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. And so he tells us here in Galatians, the sixth chapter, verse 10, As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. So we should be doing good unto all men. Remember, uh, Benjamin Franklin's autobiography in which uh, he had a regular routine and he would ask in the morning, what good thing shall I do today? And then before going to bed, he would ask the question, what good thing did I do today? So God gives us opportunities to serve. Let us not be weary in well-doing, he says in verse 9, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. So we want to recapture the true values of a way of life. And as I challenged our brethren around the world in that sermon, I gave examples of of recapturing true values in country western music, where some that I'd heard all revolved around adultery and drunkenness. And as a result, I want to thank all of you who have sent, at least uh, I say many people have sent in Uh, some very good country western music that promotes godly values. So thank you very much. And I also uh, mentioned about the exciting uh, music that I heard back in Swope Park, I think 1961 in Kansas City, when my wife and I heard live Doc Severinsen, the trumpeter who was with Johnny Carson for so many years, outstanding trumpeter, and he and his tour group did uh, the 150th Psalm, how exciting it was, and it was in rock style. And for years, I've been wanting to hear a recording of that, and uh, just a few months ago, it came up on the Internet, because you did a search, you do a search, you couldn't find it, but it did come up on the Internet uh, here recently, and uh, it's not exactly the same performance that uh, Doc Severinsen did in Kansas City, but it is very exciting. And so I would encourage you uh, to just go on Google and put in Doc Severinsen, uh, Psalm 150, and uh, you'll be able to hear it. It's exciting. The trumpet that he plays is just extremely exciting and gives you a different feeling for Psalm 150. But we need to recapture true values in every aspect of our life. Turn to Colossians 1, verse 17. We've had sermonettes on this in the past. Colossians 1, verse 17. He is before all things, and by him all things consist. I'm sorry, that's Colossians 3, 17 is what I want. Colossians 3, 17. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. And Mr. Meredith did a uh, telecast on what would Jesus do, and also had a Tomorrow's World Magazine article on that subject. And the world misuses the question. It's a good question. What would Jesus do in this circumstance? But the world 
answers the question according to a false Jesus and comes up with a false answer. But how do you conduct your life? Is there anything in your life that you have done or are doing in habit or deed or in attitude that you would say is not in the name of the Lord Jesus, that would not be approved by him or encouraged by him? When it does all things, we're talking about brushing our teeth, we're talking about work ethics, we're talking about marital relations, we're talking about entertainment we capture, recapture true values in every aspect of life. And that can be one of the most exciting, one of the most fulfilling, one of the most rewarding and enjoyable activities of all. Recapturing true values of humor. And uh, when there actually are Christian groups, and uh, at least I've heard of one or two of them in the Los Angeles or California area, that are Christian comedy groups. In other words, they are trying to recapture the values of clean humor. Whenever you go on to the comedy club on television, what do you get? Double entendre, gross language, you know, filthy images. But you need and I need to recapture the true values in every aspect of life. And good humor can be very funny, very humorous, and uh, very rewarding. Not that we always hit the nail on the head. We try. So we recapture true values. There, is the, there are several, again, sermons in our tape library. There's the one by uh, Mr. Bryce, Restore Apostolic Christianity. Mr. Meredith had two uh, sermons on restoring apostolic Christianity. And then we have the Seventh Law of Success, number 286, and uh, the Biblical Health Laws, number 278, you know, there are values. You know, the discussion about the elections last November was amazing because part of the political spectrum found out they were shocked that President Bush won again, and they, they finally got into a discussion of values. Why did this happen? But in all the talk shows I listened to, in terms of values, very, very few of them focused on the framework for values. I mean, a value that someone designates as uh, an adulterous relationship, they may think that's a good value, but no, it's not a biblical value, as Mr. O'Gwin was mentioning in the telecast that we just saw, that part of the implication of evolution is the rejection and the freedom from biblical morality. But we want to capture, recapture the values of biblical morality, we are in training as teachers for tomorrow's world. So number 11 is recapture true values. Number 12, as a fundamental of Christianity, is to follow the model prayer. Let's turn to Matthew 6. Now, I know that many of you have been in the church for decades, and yet do you at least once in a while follow this outline? You know, there's a time to pray from your heart, as, as David did. In Psalm 13, he said, well, how long, O Lord, is it going to be before you answer me? He, he complained to God. He was very heartfelt and sharing. And he shared his frustrations, his questions, his doubts, his, his complaints with God, his concerns, his fears. But... There is a time when we approach God as following the model that is following the outline of this prayer. And it's worth a whole sermon, but he says, After this manner, therefore, pray you, Matthew 6, verse 9, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. And that, that whole section, I, I haven't recently, but in times past, I've spent a whole hour in prayer just on that one subject alone. I remember praying by the window of our home there in Big Sandy looking out on Lake Loma. And it must have been a summer day. I had the window open and there was a screen there. And I was praying about God's creation and how wonderful it was and how wonderful he is as a creator. And this, this spider was crawling on the, on the screen. And there was a little tiny fly. 
And the spider was trying to get the fly. And I said, go get him, get him. But every time the spider got close to the fly, the fly moved away. And I was just, this was just such a little tiny element, a little tiny experience in God's awesome creation of the web of life that goes all the way from the bottom of the seas to the top of the stratosphere that we understand God's awesome great creation. So we honor his name as the creator and as the lawgiver, as the life giver and the sustainer and the designer and the one who fulfills prophecy and the one who answers prayers, and as the eternal who heals and as the father of lights. And his name, of course, represents his character and his office. And then he goes on to say, your kingdom come. And I don't know how many times yesterday I remember I just kept whatever reading the news saying, your kingdom come. Why does God's kingdom need to come? Do you feel a need for God's kingdom to come? Not only for yourself, but for your family, for your friends, for the resurrection of the saints, to put away the violence, the atrocities that are committed, the world war, the ultimate great tribulation that is coming, to put away false religion, false education, and to recapture the true values. We look forward to seeing God's kingdom set up on earth that we can have world peace. Now, following the model prayer, number 12, as a fundamental, actually is a subset of a larger principle, you know, and that is applying the keys of spiritual growth. Let's turn to 2 Timothy 2.15. You can continue to read through Matthew, the sixth chapter, but you know he ends that, You see, when you're praying, the model prayer starts with the power and office of God. So if you've got a problem, you start off with a focus on who and what God is. And how does that prayer in Matthew 6 end? Well, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So you end the prayer with an acknowledgement of God's power and His greatness. And you start your prayer with an acknowledgement of who and what God is. And then you sandwich in between all the other elements. And then your concerns, your pain, your requests fit into that context of who and what God is. But here in 2 Timothy... I haven't turned to it yet, 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15. Uh, Some of you all know that. The King James says, study to show yourself approved unto God. It doesn't necessarily mean study, that is, read a book. The other translations are to be diligent. That is, the ultimate result is the same because you must rightly divide the word of truth. Or as the RSV has, rightly handling the word of truth. Or the RSV has, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved rather than study. But we know that Bible study is so extremely important because Jesus said, you are clean by the word that I've spoken unto you, verse 5. In in a sense, the word of God can clean you up as you apply it. Of course, the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin, as it says in 1 John 1, verse 7. But nonetheless... We've got to apply those principles, those keys for spiritual growth, which are prayer, Bible study, fasting, and meditation. And think of God's throne when you pray. Let's turn to Hebrews, the 12th chapter. Hebrews, the 12th chapter. I remember one time uh, walking with Mr. Meredith out in uh, Rancho Penasquitas. We uh, took a walk down by the canyon, and uh, we were coming back. And we were talking about the work and uh, various uh, topics. As we came back, here was a double rainbow. Not just one beautiful rainbow, but a double rainbow. And I could not think of anything but God's throne, because he talks about the rainbow, about his throne, how glorious it is. In Hebrews, the 12th chapter, starting with verse 22, But you are coming to Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, 
and to an innumerable company of angels, and to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than of Abel. So when you come to God's throne, you're coming to the Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and the spirits of just men made perfect. So God keeps the spirits of just men, and they will be resurrected. They are not conscious, but we will be resurrected at the return of Jesus Christ. You see, they were made perfect. And I've seen, as I mentioned before, those who were on their deathbed who had a degree of spirituality and maturity that I had not attained. And that growth in maturity and spiritual maturity comes through a lifetime. So the twelfth one is to follow the model prayer and to apply the keys to spiritual growth and, of course, the four basic tools, as we call them, prayer, Bible study, meditation, and fasting. So how can we grow in maturity and how can we go on to perfection? Well, we practice the fundamentals. I won't turn there, but you know Second Peter 3.18 but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. You will grow in his perfect and righteous character if we apply those fundamentals. Turn back to Matthew, the seventh chapter, Matthew 7. Matthew 7 and verse 24. Mr. Bryce gave a sermon on the true trees and the two houses. Matthew 7, verse 24. Therefore, whosoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that rock, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. We've talked about the foundation that we all must have established, and Christ is the foundation. And yet our beliefs are foundational and our practice of the fundamentals of Christianity are foundational as well. And there are those who are going to fall when the winds come and when the floods come. Verse 26, And everyone that hears these sayings of mine and does them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. The rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Nations are going to fall because they have not founded their principles and their morality upon Christ's words. So if we are going to go on to perfection, we need to apply and live by Christ's words. As he said, when the winds blow and the rain comes and the floods come, that house did not fall. It was founded upon a rock. Is your spiritual house founded upon a rock? You're also going to be able to go on to perfection by keeping your eye on the goal. Let's turn to Philippians 3. Philippians 3, starting with verse 12. When you look up the word perfect or perfection, uh, you find find it occurring uh, many places. My eye just fell on one here, which I didn't see before. Uh, Philippians 3. 15, that is in the King James, let us therefore as many as be perfect or mature be thus minded. But starting with verse 12, Philippians 3, the Apostle Paul says, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect. So the Apostle Paul admits that he was not yet perfect. But I follow after, if that I may apprehend, for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count myself not to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things that that are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Are you pressing or are you loafing? Let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded. Keep your eye on the goal. Paul knew that he was not already perfect. But he kept his eye on the goal and went forward in faith 
toward that goal. How else are we going to go on to perfection? Endure trials. James 1, verse 2. You've heard this many times, but it's very appropriate for this topic in the sermon because how is your character perfected? How are you transformed into the image of Christ? Oftentimes by suffering. I've told you the story before about one sophomore who asked me in class one time, he said, well, why, why are we sophomores, Mr. Ames, not, uh, not with it so much? <laughs> and he uh, says, why, why are we always getting in trouble? I said, well, you, you haven't suffered. You know, when you suffer, you learn. And that's what James says here. My brethren, count it all joy. James 1, verse 2, when you fall into diverse trials or temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience. I know one person, oh, I've heard it more than one person, and perhaps I've said the same. I don't understand why God is allowing me to go through this trial. But it almost seems as if that understanding begs the question of what God is doing through that trial or what he wants you to learn through that trial. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience. So if anything, you, you certainly find to ask God to understand, what am I, am I doing something wrong? Or did someone else do something wrong? What must I learn through this trial? But the there are one or two very solid answers, and this is one of them, that you learn patience. Now, patience is a quality as a godly quality. And it's the very first one, if you know, 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, what is the very first quality of charity or of godly love? Charity suffers long. Charity, love is patient. It's a godly character. And uh, let's, uh, let's admit, how patient or impatient are we? The now generation, some time ago, it's, it's now it's uh, now the, not the now generation, it's the warp speed generation. You know, we want it done before you even think about it almost. But as I said before, Mr. Meredith plans out two and three years in advance and And uh, he knows what patience is. But we have to have long-term plans as well. Your faith works patience, but let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect and entire, lacking nothing. Now, that is the goal that God has in each of us to create in us that masterpiece, as we saw in Ephesians 2.10, that he's created us for good works, that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus under good works. But he wants us to be perfect, lacking nothing. That is, we need to have the mind of God, the mind of Christ, to have the new covenant, the new the laws of God, written on our hearts and on our minds. It's a part of our nature. And we can teach others how to apply those commandments. So we understand that you must use the trial to grow in patience. One of the lessons of this section is you understand that you must use the trial to grow in faith. And you must use the trial to grow in trusting God, which Mr. Meredith has put a great deal of emphasis in in the Council of Elders meetings and uh, even in our pastor's conference. We, we trust God because he is still on his throne. He's still in charge. The stars that you see at night were there millennia ago, and they'll still be there millennia ahead unless to whatever degree God uh, creates the new heavens and the new earth. And so when you get that perspective... Let's turn to Hebrews 5. So we learn through, through sufferings. How do you go on to perfection? By growing in patience, growing in faith, growing in, in trusting God as you experience trials and tests. And the trial should lead to a mature, perfect, righteous, godly character. Hebrews, the fifth chapter, 
and verse 7. Speaking of Melchizedek, actually of Christ, who was after the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplication with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, and he was heard in that he feared. Yes, Jesus had a godly fear. And you can read that back in the Messianic prophecy in Isaiah the 11th chapter, that he would delight in the fear of the Lord. So Christ had a godly fear, which is one of the other translations. New King James Version, because of his godly fear, verse 8, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered and being made perfect. He became the author of eternal salvation unto all that obey him. So sufferings gave a completeness to Christ's human experience that he can now be our great high priest for he was tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin. Let's turn to 1 Peter the 4th chapter, 1 Peter 4. Jesus learned through suffering and we can go on to perfection as we endure trials. He that endures unto the end, the same shall be saved. Matthew 24, 14, or 13. Verse 13. First Peter 4, 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. Well, stranger things are going to continue to happen as we've been warned with more terrorist attacks, with more disease epidemics, with more tsunamis, earthquakes, you name it. And Hurricane Dennis is on its way, and they just, uh, the Hurricane Center is surprised how early this season these hurricanes are developing. But he goes on to say, Rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings. So when you're suffering, you're in pain, try to identify your suffering with that of Christ's. That when his glory shall be revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. Then he goes on to say, we are under judgment, verse 17, for the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Now, judgment doesn't have to be a painful experience. It just means that you must be responsible for your actions. And that as you apply the commandments of God, as you apply the principles of God, and you reap the benefits and the rewards and the, and the blessings from obedience to God, then you know that his way of life pays off and that it is a long-term benefit. And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator." So God is a faithful creator. That's what we need to trust in and believe with our whole heart and ask him to create in us his perfect character, his perfect, righteous, holy character. The the, uh, New King James has, uh, according to the will of God, commit their souls to him in doing good. In other words, while you're suffering, you still continue to do good or as the NIV has it, uh, should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. Or as the RSV has it, therefore let those who suffer according to God's will do right and entrust their souls to a faithful creator. So understand God knows what he's doing. When you're suffering and going through a test and a trial, know that God knows what he's doing. And you continue to do good in spite of whatever suffering or trial you may be experiencing. Now, one final key, and it's an important one as we go on to perfection, and that's Matthew, the fifth chapter, verse 43. Matthew 5, verse 43. Because, brethren, frankly, it is a problem with some of us here in this congregation, I'm sure with some of our brethren around the world. Some of us have biases, some of us have bigotry, prejudice, Some of us have uh, hate in our hearts. And we've not learned to go on to perfection, which Christ is saying here is the highest 
requirement to go on to his godly character and perfection. Verse 43, Matthew 5, You have heard that it has been said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies. Brethren, how many of you can say, I have obeyed Christ, I am obeying Christ, I really do love my enemies? Don't raise your hands. But I'm asking you, how many of you can really say that? If you can't, you are not mature. If you can't, you've got some growing to do and you need to begin growing faster. Now, let's understand that human affection, Jesus said, I mean, the Apostle Paul said in the end times that there would be terrible times and people would not even have natural affection. But let's assume that we have natural affection. Fathers and Mothers love their children. Children love their fathers. Families love families. Family love their friends. But it's not natural to love your enemies. And so you need divine power and help that you can have that element as a part of your nature. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Have you done that? Do good to them that hate you. Have you ever done good to someone who hates you? And pray for them that which despitefully use you and persecute you. That's God's nature. Brethren, that's why we're here. We are here to learn God's nature, to have that kind of love, to go on to that kind of perfection. Stephen did when he was being martyred, when those that hated him The rocks were crushing his skull and his rib cage. He said, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And Jesus said, forgive them for they know not what they do. Do you have that kind of love? Now notice that you may be the children of your father. Now if you're not doing this, you're not going to be the children of your father in heaven. And yet that's your very purpose for living. That you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For He makes His Son to rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. And when I was unjust as a teenager and a boy growing up, God sent rain on me. I enjoyed part of my boyhood life growing up in New London, Connecticut. We had a good neighborhood. We had... A lot of uh, good fun. But I knew my carnality as time went on in my teenage years and on. For if you love them which love you, what reward have you? Do not even the taxpayers, the publicans, the same? There's worldly flatter back and forth. And if you salute your brothers only, what do you more than others? Do you not even the taxpayers, the publicans so? Be you therefore perfect even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Or as the New King James Version, you shall be perfect even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Now how do you become perfect? The context here of perfection is divine love towards your enemies. And brethren, we need to grow in that area. Now that has, let's understand, that doesn't mean in the slightest, that you condone the evil that your enemies accomplish. You condemn the evil that wicked persons do. And you pray that they can repent and they can learn whatever lessons they need to learn so that they can be in God's kingdom. How many parents in God's church over the years have prayed for their teenagers or their children who went astray and were never seem to have any chance of being in God's church. And yet dad and mom kept praying for that son or that daughter day after day, year after year, year after year, and decades later, you know what? That, That son or that daughter was called by God. So we are to love our enemies. And we cannot have that love except that it comes from God. And we know where it comes from, Romans 5, 5. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit that's given to us. Let's turn to Colossians 3.17.
uh, 3.16, 3.14, sorry, I had Colossians 3.17 before, and I know that I would have capitalized on Colossians 3.14, but it also has to do with perfection, because you see, we are to become love like God is love, become perfect as God is perfect. And so he says in verse 14, and above all these things, Colossians 3:14, and above all these things put on love, which is the bond of perfectness. It is that binding power. It's the way of life that is outgoing, that is caring, that is sharing, that has concern. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Let's turn to uh, Romans 12. Romans 12. Ooh, sorry. You notice the time. It's flying by so fast here. Okay, well, we'll... Romans 12, verse 13. He talks about... Christian charity and how we live, we distribute to the necessity of the saints, we are given to hospitality, bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not, rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. He says, be not wise in your own conceits, the end of verse 16, verse 17, recompense to no man evil for evil, provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lies within you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. If for so in doing, you shall heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Right, two final scriptures, brethren, and we'll close quickly. Let's turn to Philippians 1. So we need a godly love that is like God's love. He loves his enemies. He loved you when you were enemies, Romans 5.10. Let's turn to Philippians 1.6. Philippians 1.6. Understand that you can be perfected. And there are the spirits of just men that have been made perfect. And if we continue, we will join those in the resurrection who are already perfected but not yet resurrected. Being confident of this very thing, Philippians 1.6, that he which has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. So you have this promise that God is working in you and through you to create his perfect righteous character. Philippians 2 and verse 12, our concluding scripture. Wherefore, my beloved as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. A sense of seriousness and sobriety, a sense of commitment. You know, the world is going to be shaken by activity, terrorist deeds, and upset weather and earthquakes. The world is going to be shaken by false religion and false miracles and signs and wonders. Will you be shaken? Or will you be on that solid foundation? Are you committed and do you know and trust that God is going to fulfill His perfect work in you? He goes on to say in verse 13, For it is God who works in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. God can create in you His perfect character. We just need to cooperate. So brethren, let's thank God for His awesome way of life. Thank Him for His awesome promises. Thank Him for the calling He's given us, that we have a foundation, a solid rock foundation of a way of life. And if we build on that foundation, all the winds and the storms and the floods will never overthrow us. So let's grow in that spiritual mind and character and nature of Christ, and let's attain the perfect character that God is creating in us. Thank God and let us go on to perfection.